There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. In last week's message, and then continuing on today, we've been talking about loving guidance and the guidance of love. Last week, we talked about loving guidance. Today, we're going to begin to talk about the guidance of love. And I think you're going to find some of the principles that I shared today intriguing. In fact, they may just revolutionize your life. If you got a Bible, grab it. And we're going to talk about the guidance of love. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. Thirdly, loving guidance means being sensitive to others. Could put it this way, you need to get to know her neighbors and friends. Look with me at Proverbs 8 and verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And I find out knowledge and discretion. It's interesting in Ephesians 1.8 in the New Testament, it puts wisdom and prudence together there as well. The Message Bible puts the verse this way. I am Lady Wisdom. I've lived next to sanity. Knowledge and discretion live just down the street. Well, friend, Lady Wisdom or Lady Guidance has chosen her neighbors and her friends carefully. It's because she is at ease with them. Knowledge, she gravitates toward people that want to grow. Prudence and discretion in dealing with others, those are very attractive to her. In the New Testament, in James 3.17, it says, the wisdom that is from above, it's peaceable, gentle, and willing to yield. But those that are unyielding in their character, that are obnoxious and arrogant and insensitive to others, can never love Lady Guidance in the right way. And remember, she loves those who love her. If you want the good counsel that Lady Guidance gives, fit in with her friends and neighbors. You know, I went out fishing with some guys. I didn't know them too well years ago. And we went out on a boat, it was gonna be out there all day from you know the crack of dawn until the sun went down, and hey, the fish were biting. We were catching Dorado and Yellowtail left and, and right. It was, it was really exciting. But there was a bombastic, arrogant, loud mouth, know-it-all jerk on the boat that made our day miserable. And even though we were doing something we loved, every person to a man could not wait to get in the dock, to get off the boat and get away from that guy. His, his personality, his character just pushed everyone away. Those same qualities drive Lady Guidance away. But prudence, knowledge, Gentleness and discretion, they attract her. Fourthly, loving lady guidance means being consistent. Proverbs 8 and verse 34. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. It's not on again, off again. It's not just about seeking her early when the big crisis of life hit. Notice she didn't say, blessed is the man who listens to me when crisis comes. But blessed is the man who listens to me watching daily. Everyone say daily. Daily, daily at my gates. It's about seeking her daily, even in the small affairs of life. Listen, all of us, you know, even down to the non-believer, we're driven to our knees when crisis comes. You know, people will get foxhole religion. Oh God, if you just help me, show me what to do. You know, get me out of this mess. And then the crisis is gone and, and we forget all about the promises we made and, and we don't visit again until the next crisis comes. But loving wisdom 
Loving guidance means daily. That means in the small stuff. That means in the little things, not when some critical thing is looming, you know, over us. You know, I, I have a friend, and he actually just called me the other day. And the thing is, he only calls me when he wants me to support some ministry endeavor he's involved in. The only time he ever calls me is when he wants money. And I got off the phone with him, and I, Janet walked in the room, and I just I started talking. She said, Honey, this bugs me so much. I've known this guy for years, and the only time he, he ever calls, he never calls just to talk to me. He never wants to find out how I'm doing, never wants to talk about anything. The only time I hear from him is when he wants me to support something that he is doing. Let's not treat guidance that way. Love her, and she'll promote you. She'll bless you, and she will bring you to honor. She said, I love those who love me. Let's move to the other side of the coin here, the second part of the message, the guidance of love. Loving guidance, and then the guidance of love. According to Romans 5 and verse 5, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Has anyone read that verse before? Right, God's love has been poured into our hearts. Listen to this verse. It's 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. It said, the Apostle Paul actually made this statement. He said, for the love of Christ compels us. This love of God, this love of Christ that's been poured into our hearts it compels us. Other translations say the love of Christ urges us. Another translation said the love of Christ moves us. Yet another said the love of Christ directs us. And I like the King James Version, actually. It says the love of Christ constrains us. The Greek word literally means to control. The love of Christ controls us and it either controls us. The word goes two ways. It means control and compelling someone to move forward or controlling someone in restraining them to stay still and not move at all. It can be either way. The love of God compels me. The love of God constrains me. The love of God moves me. The love of God causes me to stand still. Depending on the situation, God's love may direct us either way. We need, we need to be sensitive as to which way that is. Look with me in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Luke's Gospel 15. I'm going to help somebody in a minute. <laughs> Luke 15. Now, in verses 1 through 7 of Luke 15, Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep. You all know it. Guys, you know, 100 sheep, one's gone. He leaves the 99, goes out into the wilderness, seeks the lost sheep, brings it back rejoicing, throws a party. I don't know who'd throw a party over a lost sheep that got found, but the guy in this parable does. Next parable is the one about the lost coin. Lady loses a coin. She immediately goes and begins to search for it until she finds it. She calls all of her friends and rejoice. I found my lost coin. And then the third parable we find in verse 11 through 32, and that's the parable of the lost son. But unlike the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin, the father did not go out after the lost son and search for him. It's one thing that is distinctly, distinctly different about this parable. Look at it with me, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country where he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The word prodigal just means wild, unrestrained, sinful living. I think the Living Bible said he wasted all of his, his possessions on prostitutes and parties. 
pretty close to a bullseye there. In fact, rumors of what was going on with him in this far country apparently drifted back home because when the older brother was out in the field and he hears the music and dancing after the father's restored the son that came home, he had gotten one of the services, what's going on? I said, hey, your, your brother came back. And he's so mad, the older brother won't go into the party. So dad comes out and says, hey, look, come in. He says, hey, well, this son of yours that wasted all of your inheritance on harlots, and you throwing a party for him? So they knew the father and the brother had gotten rumors of what this one son slash brother had been up to. And you know, the father, he would have known what was on his son's mind. He knew his disposition before he ever left. Once he got his stuff, it was a very few short days until he took everything. They said, I'm getting away from this place. I'm getting away from you. I'm getting away from this lifestyle. Forget this whole farming, you know, raising sheep thing. And, you know, he goes to the big city. Well, dad, daddy knew what his son's disposition was. And daddy loved him. Verse 13. Again, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Right? He's gone into a far country, but the father did not make any move to rescue him. He wasted everything. Wild, loose living. And the father knows about it, but he doesn't come. You see, the son's heart and the son's attitude at this point were still unchanged. The father is being restrained by love's guidance. Verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Right? He's lost everything. All of his friends are gone. You know, the Bible says every man is a friend to him that gives gifts. But when the gifts stop, generally the friendships stop as well. So here he's in want. Everyone's deserted him. And the father doesn't come. Because the young man's heart is still unchanged. His attitude is still unchanged. Verse 15 then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now to the Jewish audience Jesus was sharing this parable with, to them, you couldn't get any lower. You couldn't fall any farther. Here you're with, you've joined yourself to a Gentile. You're a Gentile servant, and you are feeding pigs but the son's heart is still unchanged. His attitude is still unchanged, and the father makes no move whatsoever to come and rescue him. The father had the resources to rescue him. He had the knowledge to rescue him. He had the means to rescue him, but he didn't come. Verse 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate but no one gave him anything. So he falls even further. Now he's even envious of the pigs. Does the father come? No. His heart is still unchanged. His attitude is still hardened. But then, verse 17, but when... He came to himself. That's worth underlining, friend. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came. To his father. Now his heart has changed. 
Now his pride has been broken. And as he's walking the long road home, he's an absolute wreck. And he's emptied of all arrogance and all pride. He has gone from verse 12 where he, where he said, give me, to verse 19 where he said, make me. What a difference. Give me what's mine. Give me my inheritance. Father, make me. What a difference in heart. What a difference in attitude. Verse 20, and he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So now the father is overcome and compelled by love. And he runs to the boy, embraces him, kisses him, and blesses him. Now when the boy left, daddy never searched for him like in the parable with the lost sheep and the parable with the lost coin. He let the storm do its work. It would have been fruitless to do anything more than pray for him before that because he hadn't come to himself and he hadn't moved from give me to please make me. When he restrained his help, it was the guidance of love. When he ran and embraced him and poured out his blessing, it was the guidance of love. The love of God compels me, and the love of God constrains me. And you know what? When we love Lady Guidance, she'll let us know which is which. Many years ago, I had a gentleman come to me. He didn't attend our church. He had a, a ministry that he would maybe quarterly, he would take teams from different churches to a particular African nation on missions trips. It was a good ministry. And he'd come on hard times and, you know, made his pitch to me and said, look, you know, I, I can't make the rent. You know, my, my family and I were really under pressure. This is what we do. And so I, I checked up, found out what he did was legitimate. And I, I prayed about it. And I, I felt the love of God compelling me to help him. And so I, I got together with him and I said, brother, I said, I'm going to help you. You know, God bless your ministry. But I just want to give you some advice. You know, you're, you're doing these trips quarterly. You, you need to get a job, even if it's a part-time job to make up the difference for this. You obviously, you don't, you know, make enough resource with, with doing these trips to support your family, to make your rent, to take care of your obligations. So, you know, I'm gonna help you, but you need to get a job. He said, oh, pastor, thank you. He said, I will, I, I will, I, I realize that's right. Well, six months later, I get a call from him. He said, pastor, pastor, help. You know, I know you helped me before and, and I'm in a situation again and, and I just, just really need your help, you know, one more time. And I met together with him and asked him if he'd try to get a job. Well, yeah, kind of, I tried. And listen, it, the, the economy was good then. You, you could get a job if you wanted one. And I said, brother, let me pray about it. And I prayed, and I felt like the love of God was compelling me to help him with a caveat, with a message. So I got together with him and said, brother, I'm going to help you one more time. But I feel like I'm going to do it with this message. God has told me to tell you this. What I'm giving you right now, this is not an answer to your faith, okay? 
This is not the fruit of your faith that you've prayed and, and God has answered your faith. That's not what this is. What this is, is mercy. That's all this is, is mercy. You need to get a job. Do you understand? I'm, I'm telling you, I believe God's telling me to tell you this. This is not an answer to your prayer. This is not the fruit of your great faith. This is strictly mercy. That's all this is. But I feel the love of God telling me to help you again, but get a job. I will, pastor, thank you. I will. Six months later. Pastor, can you help me again? I said, no. He said, please, please. And I, you know, he'd actually gotten my home number. This was back before the days of mobile phones. And he called me incessantly at my home. He called me at six in the morning. He said, Pastor, please, I'm in a pressure cooker. My family's in trouble. He threw so much guilt on me. And he called me day after day after day. And I got to God. I said, look, I'm going to meet with you. No promises. I sat down with him, listened to him, and I said, I'm not going to help you. He said, you haven't even tried to get a job in the last six months. And I told you that God told me to tell you to do that. Oh, but pastor, you have to. And then he started throwing scriptures at me. He said, Jesus said, give to him that asks of you. You know, the Bible says, if, if you close up your bowels of compassion to him that has need, how does the love of God dwell in you? So he started bashing me over the head with the Bible. So I bashed him back. I said, listen. I said, do you remember Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? He said, yeah. I said, do you remember when, when Paul and Silas, they tried to go into Bithynia to preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them? And they tried to go into Asia Minor and the Holy Spirit forbid them to go there? He said, yeah. I said, well, isn't Bithynia part of all the world? Yeah. Isn't Asia Minor part of all the world? Yeah. I said, but the Holy Spirit forbid them to do it even though Jesus said go into all the world? So I guess they had some specific things to do. He said, I guess so. I said, I said, the same Holy Spirit that forbid Paul and Silas to go into Asia Minor and Bithynia is forbidding me to give you any more money. Go away. And I didn't help him. And I didn't mean to be cruel with him. But listen, the first time, the love of God compelled me. The second time, the love of God compelled me. The third time, the love of God constrained me. It was the best thing for him. It would not have helped him any more than it would have been of help for the father to run into that far country and bail his son out that had never had a change of heart. The question, how does this message apply to you. What's God saying to you tonight? To start loving lady guidance? Or maybe to listen to the guidance of love? For some of you, maybe his love is compelling you to move. Follow that guidance. Others, maybe the love of God is constraining you and saying, you know what? If you do that, it's not going to have my blessing. Loving guidance and the guidance of love. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, we just want to take a moment and just marinate in, in what your Holy Spirit may be saying to us right now. Well, I'd like to say to you what Mary told the servants of the wedding feast when they ran out of wine. She said about her son Jesus, whatever he says to you, do it. And I want to tell you, whatever he says to you, do it. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. My friend, it always pays to obey God. And the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And friend, 
Love needs to set the boundaries and the borders of our life. And if God has been speaking to you, do what he says. You know that the words of Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee are, are so appropriate. Whatever he says to you, do it. And there are always rewards when it comes to obeying God. We'll see you next week. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Hey there, friend. Bayless Conley here. I'm actually in Paris, France. In the background behind me, you can see the famous Louvre. And you know, I was here thinking, we've been doing a little bit of taping and I, I like to do these little segments and usually try and have something inspirational for it. But you know, I didn't have any inspiration at all right now, but then I thought about it. A lot of people are waiting until they feel inspired before they obey God or before they do anything. You don't need to feel inspired to obey God. You just need to read your Bible and do it. If it says give, you need to give. If it says go, you need to go. If it says love, you need to love. If it says forgive, you need to forgive. You don't need to feel goosebumps or have some sort of a revelation or feel inspired. You just need to obey. You know, if, if you read it and you understand it, be a doer of it and don't wait for inspiration. Just put one foot in front of the other because really, those are the great men and the great women of God. Those that just go out and obey the word, whether they have feelings or whether they have don't, don't have feelings, whether the sun's shining or whether the rain is falling, whether they feel inspired or whether they don't feel inspired. They just do what the Word of God says. So be a doer of the Word and don't wait for some feeling or for some inspiration to get busy. Hope that helps you. God bless. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org. so excited. I'm going to be coming again to a number of cities throughout Germany and Switzerland, two of my favorite nations. I'm going to be preaching the Word of God, and I really want to encourage you to find out where the meetings are. Come out if you can. I would love to meet you personally, and we just trust the blessing of God is going to be on our time together in Germany and Switzerland. Some have a lot. Others have very little. God longs to love others through you, not wanting anyone to lack. Show someone how much God cares. Let your love demonstrate how highly He values each and every one of us. In Love Your Neighbor, Bayless Conley reveals how showing God's love to those in your everyday world can radically enrich both their lives and yours. Play your part in fulfilling God's greatest commandment, Order Love Your Neighbor on CD or DVD. Call now or order online at AnswersBC.org.